Turn with us to the book of 2 Chronicles, chapter 20. 2 Chronicles, chapter 20. I just want to thank you all for allowing us this opportunity to be here tonight, be a part of your meeting, and uh, praying for you that God will move and that He'll revive. A uh, great song to start out the meeting. Revive us again. That's our prayer. Amen. Amen. You remember the psalmist said, Wilt God not revive us again that thy children may rejoice in thee? And our prayer is that God will revive not only Gustin Baptist, but all Christians around this world. Amen. Amen. We, we need revival. We need God to move and, and to bless and to touch. We appreciate this opportunity to be here. Appreciate Brother Bobby inviting us uh, to, to come and be with you. Uh, let me encourage you. Support him. He's the man of God that, that's here, that God sent. He's a wonderful man of God. I pray that you will support him, his family, his wife. Uh, and uh, so y'all just, y'all be there for him. Support him with your prayers, your encouraging words. And uh, I know God will bless you for that. Any veterans tonight? Any veterans? Raise your hand. Any veterans? Let's show our appreciation to them tonight for the service. Amen. Appreciate y'all for serving and uh, allowing us this opportunity to come and to worship. Good to see Brother Glenn here tonight. Brother Glenn's pastor of Lee's Lane Baptist Church up in Louisville. We've had the opportunity to be there with them for a couple of meetings. And uh, God's doing a mighty work there. Amen, Brother Glenn. And y'all are in for a treat tomorrow night. You're able to hear him preach. Y'all come back. And uh, Brother Bobby was telling us uh, last week when we were talking on the phone that there may be several churches here. I'm not sure how many are represented. But uh, if, if they were able to come to y'all's meeting... I don't encourage you to go and support their meeting as well if you hear of, of them having a revival. We all go and support them as well. So I know they'll I know they will appreciate that. Uh, wish my wife and we have a three-year-old daughter, but we're fostering a six-year-old daughter. Wish they could be here, but uh, they got school tomorrow. My wife's a teacher, and so she said, I'm gonna put them to bed. And I said, Good, then I'm gonna leave. So uh, see y'all later. And see y'all in the morning. <laughs> so uh, glad that uh, y'all didn't let the rain and the dropping temperatures scare y'all away. Uh, I'm glad y'all could be here tonight. Second Chronicles chapter 20. We're going to look at tonight what to do when you don't know what to do. What to do when you don't know what to do. Anybody ever been there before in life, in your Christian life? You just get to a point where, man, I just don't know what to do anymore. You're saved. That's no problem. But sometimes you get to a point in life where you're like, man, a lot. What am I going to do? What's the next step going to look like? Well, we're going to read a story here. We're just going to read one verse, but we'll, we'll, we'll look at the, the story here in a second. In verse number 12 of chapter 20 of 2 Chronicles, look what they say. O our God, wilt thou not judge them? For we have no might against this great company that cometh against us. Neither know we what to do, but our eyes are upon thee. Heavenly Father, as we break the bread of life for a few minutes... We pray that you speak to our hearts. Be with the invitation here in just a few minutes. We pray if anyone here needs to come and do business with you, I pray they'll come and kneel in this altar of prayer and just pray and just seek your face, Lord, and I pray that you'll bless them uh, during that time. Well, thank you for it, and also we pray in your son's precious and holy name. Amen. Amen. I want you to notice in verse number 12, it says, O our God, wilt thou not judge them? And he talks about a great and mighty company that has come against Judah. But what has happened in chapter 20, especially in verse number 1, the Moabites and the Ammonites have uh, come together and they have come and they have surrounded Judah. They have surrounded Judah and so they go to Jehoshaphat and they say, listen, we're in trouble, big boy. We're in trouble. And I want you to notice that Jehoshaphat, he, he, he gathers the people together and, and so they, they come together and he, and he professes a fast. We know what a fast is, Correct. I know you like to eat, but how many likes to fast? Amen? But he professes a fast. He says, we're going to fast, we're going to pray, we're going to come together, we're going to ask God what's going to happen next. Because when they, they, they had no idea. The next second, the next minute, the next day was not guaranteed because two great big companies of armies have come and they surrounded Judah. They had no idea. I mean, in a snap of a finger, their day and their lives could have ended. And so finally they get to the point to where they come to the edge of the cliff and they finally look up to God and say, we got two big armies that have come against us. They were mighty. They were strong. We've got two big armies that have come against us and we don't know what to do.
to do. About four and a half years ago, our family went through a situation that knocked us all for a loop, ladies and gentlemen. I want you to notice, when you go through situations like that, it ain't just one or two people in your family, one or two people around you uh, that go through it. Everyone goes through it with you. Now, granted, I'm from Tennessee, and the situation happened in Tennessee. I'm three hours away, and somebody might say, well, it shouldn't have affected you that much. Really? When your folks have been together for 30 years, and something happens, and they're all of a sudden not together anymore, that kind of does something to you, doesn't it? And so I finally got to a point, I got a uh, brother that's four and a half years younger than me, and we finally got to a point and we said, what are we going to do? What are we going to do? We don't know what the next day has in store for us. And he and I, thankfully, we're close, we're really close, and we were able to talk. If it wasn't daily, it was every other day. And I'm glad I had that support there but sometimes I got, there were some days I just said, you know what? I just don't know what to do. What's next, God? What is the next step going to look like in my life, in the life of our family? What's Christmas going to look like now? What's Thanksgiving going to look like now? It was all different. And maybe you're... Uh, in your Christian life, maybe you've gotten to a point to where you finally just told God, I don't know what to do anymore. I don't know what the next step has in store for my life, life of my family, life of the church family, life of the community, life of the country, life of the world. That's a big one. Life of our state. What's going to happen now in the life of our state? I'm not here to talk about nothing like that. But just follow me. What's going to happen now? Sometimes we get to a point where we get to the edge of the cliff like these, like Judah. Listen, they've come, they've surrounded us, and we don't know what to do. But I'm glad God tells us what to do when we don't know what to do. Amen? Amen. Why? Because He's never left us and He hasn't forsaken us. Amen? Anybody, God's ever forsaken anybody in here? Not one time he's ever thrown us to the wolves or whatever the case may be and said, good luck. I'll come back and check on you in the morning. No, he stays there. He stays right with us through the thick, through the thin, whatever the case may be. He's right there with us telling us what to do. But I want to tell you something. God will never force anything on you. Hello? He may tell you what to do, but if you don't make the choice to do it, how's he going to bless it? You've got to make the free will choice to say, Lord, you told me what to do in your word. You told me what to do through your spirit, but I've got to make the choice to do it. You with me? What to do when you don't know what to do? Let us share a few thoughts with you tonight. Number one, get saved. Get saved. That's the most important decision you'll make in your, all, your entire life. I don't care how long you live. You can live as old as Methuselah lived. Getting saved is the most important decision you'll ever make in your life. Amen. Why? Because eternity hangs in the balance. Heaven's real. Hell's real. You're going to... Hey, yeah, it isn't soul sleep when you die. There's no purgatory... You're either going to heaven or you're going to hell, and that choice is yours on this earth, not when you die. And sometimes you get to a point to where you say, you know what? I've tried this, I've tried that, I've tried everything there is to try on planet earth to fill the void that I have, to fill the hole that I have in my heart and my mind. And, I, and yes, sometimes you do gain a little peace in the world. Jesus said in John 14, Peace I leave you, but not the peace that the world gives. So Jesus, the Savior of the universe, is, is even admitting himself that the world can give you peace. The world can give you peace. Places you shouldn't go, but you went, you might have gained a little peace. Things you shouldn't have done, but you did, you might have gained a little peace. 
It might have been fun for a little while, but I want to tell you something. The peace that the world gives is temporary, but the peace that Jesus gives, ladies and gentlemen, is eternal. Amen. Is eternal. Why do we fight Jesus? I don't understand it. Why do we fight the, the invitation that He gives us? Listen, you've gotten to a point you don't know what to do, lost friend. Well, Jesus tells you what to do. Believe that Jesus Christ gave up everything in heaven, was born of a virgin in Bethlehem, lived a sinless life, went to a cross, shed His blood between heaven and between earth. He died by, by saying, It is finished, paid in full. Your sins are paid for. Now the question that I have is this. What if Jesus just paid for 99.9% .9 of our sins? Who's responsible for that other .01 or whatever it is? Me and you. And I want you to know something, ladies and gentlemen. You cannot pay for .01% of your sins. You can't. If you're responsible to pay for that, you're going to wind up in hell. That's why I'm glad that the sin debt you and I accumulated was paid for on the cross by the perfect shed blood of Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. Amen. Now what if that's the end of the story? What if he dies and that's it? That's the end of the story. We're, 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 we're like those amazed disciples walking down the road downcast and we don't know what to do. And Jesus walks up and says, what's wrong, fellas? Well, ain't you heard? He's dead. You remember the story? He's dead. He's gone. And listen, I believe they love Jesus with everything they have within them. You don't call them disciples for no reason. They love Jesus. But he's dead, they said. Jesus is walking alongside them. You remember? And finally, I can't remember if he prayed or if he spoke. I don't remember. But anyway, he says something and the light bulb comes on. The light bulb comes on. He's alive. He's alive. Praise God. Jesus is alive tonight. Amen? Amen. That tomb is empty. And maybe you're getting to a point, lost friend, where you finally need the light bulb to come on in your mind and say, I'm lost. I don't know what to do, but Jesus fixes it all. I play golf. I love the game. Always love the game. Unless God just says, you don't love the game anymore. I'm going to love the game. Golf is kind of like life. My goal is to get that little white ball in that hole about 400 yards away in as less in a, you know, short amount of shots as possible. So what I want to do is hit the ball right down the middle in the fairway and on the green. I love a birdie, but hey, I'll take a par too, but and I'll move on to the next hole. You think I always hit it down the middle of the fairway? Why, Lord, no, are you kidding me? Sometimes there's water on the hole. <laughs> Sometimes there's out of bounds over here or over here. Sometimes I hit it that way, hit it that way, put it in the water, and then I got to recover and get back out in the fairway. In life, who wouldn't want everything to go right? Down the middle and on the green. Sometimes we go that way, don't we? And then lost people say, well, how can I fix it? How can I get back on track? You can't. Jesus gets you back on track. If you're here and you're not saved tonight, you've run into a brick wall, you've tried everything under the sun to try to help yourself. It's time to realize I can't, but Jesus can and you come, remember Ephesians 2, 8 and 9? For by grace, right? Are you saved through what? Faith. And it's not of yourselves, it is a gift. What's the gift? Well, there's a group of people that will want to tell you that the gift is the faith. But not everyone gets the gift. That's false. The gift is salvation if you exercise faith in Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen? It's not of yourselves. It's a gift. 
not by works lest any man should boast. You're here and you've run into a brick wall and you've realized I'm lost, I'm a sinner and I'm on my way to hell. But I'm going to get in this altar of prayer tonight and I'm going to just pray my way through and surrender my life by faith and repentance of sin in Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. Get saved tonight if you're not saved. Secondly, Christians, maybe in life, Christian life, you don't know what to do. Let us submit some things to you. Would you pray? Why is prayer probably the most preached and taught topic in every single church, but it's the least thing done among Christians? It's the least thing done among Christians. I don't know why. Because there's a commandment in the New Testament, 2 Thessalonians, what, 5.17, or 1 Thessalonians 5.17? Pray without ceasing. And yet we cease our prayers. I don't know why we do it. But there's got to come a time in our life where we figure out, you know what? God tells me to pray, so guess what I'm going to do? Pray. Things ain't going the way they should. I'm in a storm. Or I'm going in a storm. Family situations. Financial situations. Children. Maybe your children and your grandchildren ain't doing what you raised them to do. That's tough on you, isn't it? Well, you're definitely not going to beat them and doing what you want them to do. So guess what the next best thing is to do? Pray. There's a gentleman in our church that come to me. He got saved, and he got saved later on in life, and we baptized him. He says, I've got a boy that's not saved. He said, and I'll take responsibility for it because I wasn't saved myself when I was raising him. He lost his wife in a car accident back in the 80s, so he raised him himself. He said, I'll take responsibility for it because I wasn't saved, and I didn't go to church. But boy, I would love to start praying for him. I said, that's a great idea. It's been several years ago. And he prayed and he prayed. About two and a half, three years later, he come to me and said, I've been praying for about three years. I've been praying for three years. Ain't nothing happening. You know what I told him to do, Brother Bobby? I said, keep praying. Amen. Keep praying. Two months ago, he came to my office and he said, I got to tell you something. And I knew it was good. Hey, listen, he knows, Brother Glenn knows, when someone approaches you and wants to tell you something, you can tell by their facial expressions whether it's going to be good news or it's going to be bad news. And I could tell right quick it was good news. Amen. He said, my boy got saved last Sunday. Because he knew there was nothing he could do to get him saved except maybe share the gospel. Yes, he could do that, and he did Share him about Jesus. But there was nothing he could do except what? Pray. And his boy got saved. And now he's going to heaven one day. Amen. Pray. Just keep... I've been praying for 30 years. Well, guess what? Keep praying. You still breathing? Y'all still breathing? Everybody okay? Then keep praying. Keep praying. Jesus. Perfect in every way possible. Absolutely nothing sinful about him. God robed in human flesh felt the need to pray. He went to the Garden of Gethsemane knowing exactly what was going to happen to him. He knew everything that was going to happen. The beating, the crown of thorns, the nails. He knew it all and even Jesus felt the need to pray. If perfect Jesus felt the need to pray, what does that say about me and you? Need to pray. pray. Secondly, study your Bible. Study your Bible. I don't know who lives under your roof. It may just be you and your spouse. Maybe just be you. Maybe you do have some family under your I don't know your situations. But man, I am going to talk to you for a second. Don't bow your heads. You haven't had time to pray. But men, I am going to talk to you. 
It's your responsibility and my responsibility to make sure the Bible is open in our home. Amen? There's a lot of wives and mothers that are going to get a lot of blessings in heaven because they did what the husband and the father was supposed to do. You with me? And I commend you, ladies, if that's you. If that's you, I commend you. God bless you. Men, let's step it up a notch or two. It's my responsibility to get my wife, Emily Ann, our three-year-old Anna Claire and our the foster child, Lucy. It's, our, it's my responsibility to get them around that dinner table and we eat dinner or supper, whatever the case may be, and, and we call it supper at our house. I don't know what y'all call it. But we eat supper, and then I open the Bible and we read it few passages of scripture and pray. You're going to find the answers in the Bible if you look. If you look. Listen, your pastor does not mind you asking him questions about the scriptures. I want to tell you that right now. But there are going to be, there's going to have to come a time where you sit down yourself and break the bread of life. Why is it do we just come on Sunday mornings and get fed on Sunday mornings? And maybe a Sunday night or two here and there. Why? Y'all don't eat twice a week, do you? And say, well, I'll just, I, hopefully I'll get lucky and won't get hungry the rest of the week. No. You eat every day at least once a, once a day. Why are you going to get filled with the bread of life once a week? You remember what the Bible says? Study to show thyself approved unto God. A workman needeth not to be ashamed. Rightly dividing the Why did Paul say rightly dividing the word of truth? It's because there are people wrongly dividing the word of truth. And the people that are wrongly dividing the word of truth in our day are the ones that ain't in it. You're going to find the answers to life if you'll get in it. You say, well, how do I do that? Where do I start? There is no right or wrong way to read the Bible. Just read it. Go through the New Testament in a year. Read, you know, that's easy. One chapter a day, starting in Matthew, no Saturdays or Sundays, you'll be done in a year. We don't have enough time for God to read a chapter? Are you kidding me? What's wrong with us? Get in your, God commands us. To get in the Word of God. I believe it's perfect from cover to cover. And if I believe that, why am I going to trust another book or some self-help book or whatever when I've got the Word of God, the inspired Word of God from Genesis 1-1 to Revelation 22-21? I'm crazy if that's what I trust in. You're going to find the answers. You don't know what to do? Get in the Word. Get in the Word. Judah said our eyes are upon you. If you ain't praying, you ain't studying, your eyes ain't upon you. What? How dare you tell me my eyes aren't upon God if I don't pray and I don't study? Well, what other option is it? What other choice you got? Listen, it's one or two, it ain't three, four. Either your eyes are upon him or they're not. That's it. You're either with him or you're not. Study to show yourself approved unto God. Listen, what, what, what about the psalmist? 119. Thy word have I hid in my heart. Have you hid God's word in your heart? Have you hid it? Is it right there? Lastly, Christians pray, study the word, Lastly, attend church. Attend church. Brother Bobby works hard in studying the Word of God, putting together a message from God to deliver. Knows, doesn't think. He knows that it'll be helpful and beneficial to you. But if you ain't here to hear it, what more can he do? Well, we pay him to do everything. How many times have we heard that over the years? Wait a minute. You're not here to hear the Word of God. 
And yet, I'm still supposed to do everything. What am I supposed to do? I mean, hopefully you don't get sick. Hopefully you don't. If you do, he'll be there. But as far as the word of, if you're not here to hear it, how are you going to get the answers? Hopefully you are in the Bible yourself to get them. But hey, come. The Bible is helpful and beneficial to everyone that will come and will hear it and listen. There's a difference between hearing it and listening. I want you to notice that. My wife tells me often there's a difference. <laughs> One day she was sitting there just talking and had a ball game on television. Finally, I just looked up at her and I just started going. And the whole time I'm thinking, please don't ask me a question because I have no idea what you just said. You ever been there before, man? There's a difference between hearing it. I heard exactly what she said, but I didn't listen. You can come and hear the Word of God, but until you listen to the Word of God, there's a difference. Listening means what? That you've allowed the Holy Spirit to take that Word and impress your heart and your mind so you can walk out of here and live a better life for the Lord Jesus Christ. Not to earn anything, but for His glory and His glory only. Amen? Amen. you got to come. So we've already talked about a, a, a commandment. Remember what Jesus said in John 14? Three times. And then John reiterates it in 1 John at least a couple of times. And even in 2 John, the short book there. If you love me, talking about Jesus, you will keep his commandments. So if you love him, that means you're saved. You're claiming to be saved if you love him. Are you going to keep his commandments? Okay, so we've already talked about a commandment for prayer. Uh... Pray without ceasing. We actually get a story with that uh, quote in it. Remember Acts? Was it Peter that was in prison? And they were back. They already put James to death. The Apostle James, not James the half-brother of Jesus. But they've already put James to death. They're going to kill Peter. But they're back at the house doing what? And the Bible specifically says they were praying without ceasing. And God got him out of prison. He shows up. She comes. The damsel comes to the door. And she hears his voice. It's Peter. It's Peter. You're nuts. It's his ghost. No, it's Peter. Why? Because you prayed. You prayed. He says, go and tell James what had, what had taken place. Is that simple? Enough? Pray without us. Pray. We've already shared a commandment about study. And study shows us proven unto God. So that's a commandment. If you love him, you'll keep that one. What about church? Is there a commandment? Sure. Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 25. I don't know who you believe wrote Hebrews. I believe Paul wrote it, but it doesn't really matter. Paul says in Hebrews chapter 10, forsaking not the assembling of yourselves together as the manner of some is. You know what that means? It means that some of you habitually do. He's telling the church, you habitually miss fellowshipping, and congregating together with the local church. But then he says what? Do you remember? I'm paraphrasing a little bit. He's basically saying, encourage one another to come. And even more so now as you see the day approaching. What day? The day that Jesus comes back. Are you forsaking the assembling of yourselves together? Are you here? Are you here on a consistent basis? Look, you've got one of the most beautiful churches that I've ever been in. Buildings. I understand we're in the church, but follow me here. Beautiful building. You know it could be packed every week. Did you know that? Packed full hearing the word of God from the man of God. Why isn't it? Because people don't have no desire to come. People don't have no desire to come. Now, one can make the argument, well, it's because we're not invited. That can be true, and I understand that. I'll follow you on that one. But people don't. They just don't want to come to church anymore. My pastor in Tennessee, Brother Todd Kirkland, wish you could meet him. He had a, he's from South Carolina, and he had a friend call him one day. Uh, when he moved to Tennessee, he started pastoring the church we went to. And he said, Todd said, uh, you're a man of God. So I, I thought I'd call you. We hadn't talked in a while. Things aren't going 
all that great in my life. He says, well, what's going on? And he told him. So well, when's the last time you had a consistent prayer life? He said, well, I don't know. I don't think I can answer that question. He said, well, when's the last time you got in the Word? Well, the kids, they got football and soccer and basketball practice. I just ain't got no time to get in the Bible. He said, when's the last time you were in church? He said, well, they got games on Sundays. They got to be at their games or, or they sit out the next game. Listen, I'm only 33 years old. Even when I was a kid, we didn't have games on Sundays and Wednesdays. Okay? We played on Saturday. And if, by just a smidgen of a chance, we had a game on Sunday, guess where Dad had me? In church. And, and I'm thankful. I had a grandfather that preached. My dad's a man of God. And so I'm glad that, that I did not get to a point where I argued with him and said, I want to go play ball. I don't want to go to church. It was, listen, it was right here and right here from a young age. You're going to be in church on Sundays and Wednesdays. It's the way it was. Our children are going to grow up like that. I'm all for ball. I'm all for games. Play sports. You can learn a lot of life lessons in sports. I'm all for it. But do not let it interfere for second the assembly together. Amen. Do not let it, do not, do not get to a point where you habitually miss hearing the word of God. Sunday school. Sunday school is all important. Don't you believe that? Sunday school is important. Get people here for Sunday school. Tell them how important it is. That, that, that you hear a, a little lesson that, that, that you can apply to your life. Some doctrinal and theological issues that are going on in the world today. What's important to you? And so Brother Todd basically told him this. He said, not that I'm saying that if you pray consistently, have a consistent Bible study time, and, and go to church regularly. He said, I'm not saying everything will go right even then. I'm here to tell you that there's your first step. And there's your first problem. You ain't praying. You're not in the Word. And you ain't going to church. You're still going to go through storms even if you do those things regularly. But I want to tell you something. You've got to be right there. And He'll bless you even through it. God, I listen, I have to believe it. I have to believe we lose blessings on earth. I don't know about you, but I have to believe it. There's been several I've missed out on. Several. That I regret missing out on. But it teaches us a lesson to not do it again. And I don't want to miss out on him anymore. I'm going to serve him. Remember the song, Serve the Lord with what? Gladness. Mm -hmm. And if serving with gladness means I pray, study, and I attend church, if that's what it takes, I want to make that commitment to God tonight is what I'm going to do. And ask him to help me. Ask Him to strengthen me. Ask Him to lead me. He's not going to force us to do any of these things. But if we just take that first step of faith, first step of obedience, God blesses and does everything else. He handles everything else. He just wants to see that first step of obedience that we can control. Are you willing to get this altar of prayer tonight? And say, I don't know what to do anymore in my life. But God, my eyes are upon you and I'm going to follow your commandments to the best of my ability. And if I do sin, I pray you will forgive me. Repentance is part of it. Let me share this little story with you. I don't know the guy. I just know the pastor told me the story. And I trust him. When I was in college at Middle Tennessee State University in Murfreesboro, we had what was called a BCM, a Baptist Collegiate Ministry. And granted, that was not the church. And the, and, and the BCM is not the church. What they do is they come alongside the church and they encourage you to go, you know, here and there. And they have several churches in the area they offer to you. Well, this young man was at a Baptist collegiate ministry somewhere here. He was a foreign exchange student. Don't know where he was from. He had gotten saved in his country before he came over here. And he, got, he was living with a Christian family. Went to church. Graduated high school. Was ready to go back to his country. He said, you know what? He told his family, he said, you know what? I think I'd like to stay here and go to college. 
So he got, and, and live here, live, live with you all. And he said, you're more than welcome to live with us if, this, if that's what you want to do. He started going to college down the road and stayed with them, went to the BCM. Now, they did there what we did at, at, at uh, Middle Tennessee State. They would have a service like you and I would have a service here in church on a Thursday night. Sing, you know, pray, and then preach and have an invitation. So we did what they did, uh, or excuse me, they did what we do here and, and, and the majority of the churches around the area. <clears throat> he was a senior in college, been in the country eight years. Preacher came and preached on repentance. Now I want you to follow this. After the service, that foreign exchange student went up to the preacher and he shook his hand. He said, Preacher, I got something to tell you. He said, I've been saved a long time. I got saved in my country before I came over here. And he said, I've been over here eight years. He said, you're the first preacher that I've heard in America that preached on repentance. That's sad. Yeah. Now, I want to tell you something. You'll get an amen out of me. If you were to say, we get saved by faith and grace, and I'll get an amen. But you ain't getting saved unless you repent of your sins. Amen? Amen. Unless you turn from them. And say, I'm turning my back. I, I, listen, I don't believe in turning your back on anybody. But when it comes to sin, turn your back on it, ladies and gentlemen. And get rid of it. And ask God to forgive you. Maybe you're here tonight. You need to get in this altar of prayer. And say, I need to be saved tonight. I want to be saved. And you come. Surrender your life to the Lord. Maybe you come and just make a commitment to God tonight. And say, I just want to pray. Maybe you just come and just pray tonight. Just come and pray. Say, God, be with, be with my family. Be with our church. Be, be with our pastor. Listen, I would encourage you to come and just extend a hand of fellowship to your pastor even during the invitation time and say, I love you. Our family loves you and your family, and we're going to support you. But I just want to pray for you tonight. Would you come and pray for him? Listen, man, I'll tell you. Why do we sit here and say, God still answers prayers. God still answers prayers. Well, sure, he answers prayers. But first, what do we got to do? Pray. Come and pray. Come and say, I'm going to make a commitment to be in the Word on a consistent... Listen, I even miss days. Now, don't throw no stones at me. I miss days sometimes. But when I miss it, man, I tell you what, there's something missing in my life. Come and make a commitment. I'm going to be in the Word. Even if it's just a passage. Just something. Teach me something every day. I make commitments. You're going to be in, be, in, be in church. Be in service. You're going to come and hear this man preach. You're going to support him. Come during this invitation time. Let us pray. After we pray, we're going to open up this altar. Brother Bobby, would you come stand up here? Brother Glenn's here to pray with you. I'm here to pray with you. We'll do, we'll, listen, we'll do what we have to do to make sure you do business with God tonight. Amen? Amen. We'll do what we have to do but you got to first make that step and come forward tonight. Father, as we sing an invitational hymn, for just a few minutes, I pray that you'll be with us. Lead us and guide us as long as you can. Speak to our hearts and help us to respond. And I also pray in your son's precious name. Amen.